Coming up on Broncos A to Z. With the losses piling up, we'll discuss what went wrong for the Broncos offense Monday night and what needs to be corrected by Sunday if Denver hopes to take the first step towards getting back to 500 before their bye week. Broncos A to Z starts right now. Hey Broncos country, Alexis Perry and Zach Stevens back with your week six edition of Broncos A to Z after another painful loss in prime time, this time to a divisional rival. Zach, I hate cliches just as much as the next person, but it really was a tale of two halves for the Broncos offense, which put up 13 points throughout the first 30 minutes and then stumbled the rest of the way. So now that you've had a couple days to really digest what you saw at SoFi, why was there such a juxtaposition between the first half and the second half for that offense? And it was really the first quarter, Alexis. Is 10 points in the first quarter for the Broncos. The on offense looks great. On pace for 40. That's the offense that we were looking for, that we expected. And I thought that was going to continue. Russell Wilson was the difference. And when you look at Russ in the first quarter, 10 of 10 in the first quarter. Completions to nine different receivers. He was just incredible, especially that touchdown to Greg Dulcich. Found a wide open Greg Dulcich for that touchdown. And then he did a great job at the end of the second, or the, the second quarter, finding uh, KJ Hamler to move down the field in 53 seconds to be able to set up a field goal. It was all Russ. And then the second half, we know what happened. Three for 11 for only 15 yards in the third, fourth quarter, and overtime combined. We'll talk about Russ's hamstring injury. Maybe that got into it, but it was really all Russ. When Russ was cooking, he was great. Uh, but then when he slowed down, the Broncos just had nowhere to turn to. Well, before we examine this game even further, first, here's an exclusive look back at the Broncos and Chargers Monday night football matchup thanks to the Broncos director of production, Austin Brink. Welcome to SoFi Stadium here in Los Angeles as we are set for a big AFC West matchup. We've got Rob Walton, Greg Penner, Kerry Walton Penner, seven time Formula One champion, Sir Lewis Hamilton. This will be their fourth primetime game to start the year, and it has not been pretty. The defense keeping them in every game. This is being called a must win game for the Broncos, and for them to pull off the upset. They have to get off to a fast start. They have to eliminate the drop passes, the penalties, the mistakes. And if Chubb and Browning can get after Herbert, they have a shot here tonight, Dave. Any sort of pressure the Broncos can bring tonight certainly will be a good thing in trying to deal with this very high-powered passing attack from the Los Angeles Chargers. Herbert now is going to be hit and sacked in the Bronco defense with a big play there. Matt Henningsen, the rookie out of Wisconsin, on the sack. His first of the year, and a big one indeed. Williams and Sertan, there's a battle of two really gifted athletes. No flag, incomplete, second down and 10. That's gonna be a great matchup to watch this whole game. Wilson in the shotgun with a pair of receivers on each side of the formation. Wilson steps up, floats to a wide open receiver, gets it to 15, 10, five, touchdown, Greg Dulcich. How about a welcome to the NFL drive for the rookie out of UCLA? What a way to start your pro career. Brother, you don't have to cut your hair for the entire season if you do that. The Chargers quickly in the line of scrimmage. Eckler hit hard, continuing to push, and he is into the end zone. Herbert shotgun. Hit as he throws, the ball is knocked free, and that was Jonathan Cooper. So far, the Broncos have been putting a lot of pressure on Herbert. Exactly what they have to do here tonight. Yeah, I tell you, no quit in this Broncos defense. And guess who? That was Alex Singleton again. Hopkins has three field goals to his credit tonight. Snap, kick on the way. The Chargers have beaten the Broncos in overtime by a final score of 19 to 16. That loss stings, especially given just how good Denver's defense performed. Yes, we will get to Damari Mathis here in just a second, but as a whole, they held the high-powered Chargers offense to just one touchdown, while Justin Herbert didn't throw a single touchdown pass for just the second time in his career. So, Zach, why were the Broncos able to have such success on Monday? Well, it was one of the things we talked about last week, stopping Austin Eckler. Yep. He had been fantastic in the Chargers' previous two wins on the ground, and the Broncos made a priority, held him to 36 rushing yards, 
yards on the ground, only 14 attempts, and forced Justin Herbert to beat him. And Justin Herbert, he's a very good quarterback, but that is very tough when a quarterback is forced to drop back almost 60 times in a game. And the Broncos were able to do that, were able to contain him, hold him without a touchdown, like you said, for the second time of his career. And the Broncos had some terrific defensive performances. And one of them was Baron Browning's ability to get after Justin Herbert. And two starts for Baron Browning. He has two and a half sacks. Then he added the interception. And that play was pretty hilarious, where he picked off Justin Herbert, fumbled the ball, and then got his own At fumble least he recovery. Got the fumble recovery. It, it, he, was, he was just patting his stats, adding a fumble to that to that as well. But it, he, he made a fantastic play. That set up the Broncos to get three points. The Broncos offense didn't move the ball after that, but they were still able to get three points after that. And then Pat Sertan, speaking of fantastic individual performances, they threw Pat Sertan's way four times. He allowed one reception for four yards. Pat Sertan is elite. We talk about it week after week, but he he if he's not the best corner in the league, he's in the top three. He was terrific. And then Alex Singleton, speaking of fantastic performances, Alex Singleton comes off the bench in place of Josie Jewell, and he has 19 individual tackles. That's the second most in NFL history 21 total tackles, just insane. Uh, and he also made a very good play, blitz Justin Herbert up the middle to, to break up a pass uh, in crunch time. So the defense was, again, fantastic. Yes, Alex Singleton, also the highest graded defensive player per PFF. So great stuff from Alex Singleton. But now we will officially get to Damari Mathis. I mean, it was a baptism by fire for Damari Mathis. Four PI calls on him. Two I think we're legitimate too. We're like, oh, but I feel like I'm kind of a homer. I think it's safe to say though, given how physical he was in college, this really wasn't a surprise. No, it's not a surprise. And also Damari Math is a rookie cornerback. When you have Pat Sertan on the other side, yeah. Justin Herbert is smart to say, I'm gonna try to pick on this rookie cornerback. And that's what he did. And like you said, Alexis, he's a very physical player. And he the good thing is he was always there. He wasn't getting burned. He was there in the right place. Uh, after the game, Nathaniel Hackett said he loved the fire in Damari Mathis' eyes, and you cannot have four uh, pass interference calls. But I really like the way that, that he competed and played, and he's only going to learn and get better from that. But he went from zero starts in the NFL, and just his first start in the NFL, he now leads the NFL in pass interference penalty. Well, I'm sure he will clean that up, of course, moving forward. But as for the offense, let's go back to the first quarter, which is arguably the best quarter that we've seen from the Broncos offense so far. I don't think it was a coincidence that Greg Dulcich was involved. What did you think about his Denver debut? What a debut it was. A California kid playing in SoFi Stadium in L.A. to make his debut against the Chargers, and he looked like the missing piece to this offense, specifically in the first quarter. Of course, he was wide open on the touchdown catch that he had from Russell Wilson, but let's not forget how involved he was in this game plan. He was only targeted three times, but two of them could have easily gone for touchdowns because when the Broncos drove at the end of the second quarter, Greg Dulcich was the one who was targeted in the end zone, just couldn't get his hands on a very, very strong pass from Russell Wilson, but Greg Dulcich, he already looks like he's their number one tight end. Okay, that ball though had flames oh coming my off of it. I don't know if anybody could have <laughs> caught that ball. It was thrown Incredibly hard, but speaking of pass catching, 10 pass catchers targeted in the first half. Second half, only three. What happened? Uh, the Broncos tried to run the ball and really establish the run. We really didn't see the run in the first half. It was all on Russell Wilson's shoulders. And it was working for the most part, but they tried to, to get Latavius Murray specifically involved in the game plan. And while Latavius was good, he averaged 4.4 yards per carry. Yep. That's great for a debut for someone at, with making a start with the new team. 230 pounds, and he looked like that. He's just a bowling ball when he gets going downhill. And we're all used to watching Javante Williams, and they run very similar styles, although very different sizes. Latavius Murray, he was bruising some defenders out there, and I was very impressed with his debut. How much did you think Russell Wilson's hand string injury had to do with the fact that they really started running the ball there in the second half. Yeah, I mean, only 11 passing attempts yeah. from Russell Wilson in the third, fourth quarter, and in overtime. I think that's very clear that, that Russell Wilson's hamstring was injured, was bothering him, and that Nathaniel Hackett knew it. And in fact, after the game, Nathaniel Hackett said that did impact their play calling. And you could tell you wouldn't go from a guy who's 10 for 10 in the, fir in the first quarter with a touchdown to then only throwing it 11 times in three different quarters combined. Well, the offense, they are averaging just 15.2 points per game, which is 
good for the league worst. What do you think is the most glaring issue with that side of the ball right now? Well, it's it's the passing game. And when you look, when Russell Wilson is moving the ball well, when he looks good, the offense is good. The first half against the Raiders, Russell Wilson looked great. I believe he only had one incompletion. Then first quarter against the Chargers, Russell Wilson 10 for 10. He looks amazing. And it all does boil down to the quarterback, but specifically with Russell Wilson when he's on the move. Greg Dulcich had the touchdown, but the play before, two plays before, when Russell Wilson and got out of the pocket and yep. found Jerry Judy. Russ was on the move. That's when Russ is at his best. And the hamstring injury is something that's very concerning because will he not be able to be that guy that, that's on the move and letting Russ move as much? That's what concerns me the most moving forward. All right, well, still to come here on Broncos A to Z, Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris will be in studio to break down a few of the game-changing plays for Monday night. And then we will turn the page to Denver's Week 7 matchup against the Jets. Don't go anywhere. Four-man pressure and sacked and down at the 20-yard line goes Justin Herbert, and that is Baron Browning. Baron Browning looked like he was shot out of a cannon, and by the time that Herbert put his right foot in the ground, Browning was there. Russell bounces around, throws a deep ball. He's got Hamler there! Hamler makes the catch inside the 30! Down to the 28-yard line, Derwin James beaten on the play. Throws the ball, there's deflected and intercepted. Intercepted the 25 yard line. Denver has it, it is fumbled. And the ball is now free. I think the Broncos still have it. Baron Browning with Bradley Chubb may have been the guy that made the play deflecting the ball. Browning got it. Thanks to Dave Logan for sharing his perspective of some of the more exciting plays from Monday night. And now I am reunited with my good friend and Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris, who is here to break down a few of the most critical plays late in that game that contributed to the end result. So we will pick things up with 504 left in regulation. It's third and eight for the Chargers and Justin Herbert is looking for Josh Palmer. This was almost a clutch play by Damari Mathis. Could have been an interception by Damari Mathis. And what we're going to see here, two coaching points. One is making sure you make contact Contact when you have press man coverage. It's not enough to just be in front of someone. You have to make contact. That's very much a change from college where Damari Mathis was playing last year. And then understanding where your help is. That's a huge thing for corners because Justin Simmons is going to be in position to allow Damari Mathis to play underneath of Palmer and possibly come up with the play. So as we start the film, it's important to notice, number one, this is the moment. Mathis is kind of standing right in front of him, Alexis, and doesn't make that contact. You gotta jump in there, make contact, reroute the receiver, and get that timing off with the quarterback. And then what Damari Mathis tries to do is to catch up with Palmer, when really he doesn't have to do that because Justin Simmons is coming over to cover anything in that area of the field. So that allows, if Damari Mathis wanted to and should have, kind of to drop underneath and make Justin Herbert float that football a little more, creating a possibility for a turnover. So not making contact and not using your help, that's what really hurt Damari Mathis on this play. That was a big point at this point in the game for the Chargers to come back and get in position to win the game. Well, we will fast forward to overtime. Broncos, they got the ball first. Latavius Murray, he had picked up nine yards on the first two plays of the drive to set up a third and one opportunity for the Broncos. But instead of going with Murray again, what happened here, Ryan? Well, the Broncos called a pass, and they called a pass that had options here. And one of the things Coach Hackett said after the game was that everybody has to do a better job of executing. And specifically, I want to point out Greg Dulcich, who I thought had a fantastic game for his first game in the NFL. He's going to come kind of across here, settle down. Now, what they tell receivers to do whenever your quarterback's moving in the pocket is to move into their point of view. And he's actually going to do a good job of getting open right about here. But Russell Wilson's going to miss him, throw it over the top. And that's going to be the play that, to me, if you make this play in this conversion to Greg Dulcich, then you're rolling offensively as the Broncos. But he just misses Dulcich, makes a pass that's incomplete. And that ended up being kind of the end of the game for the Broncos. Right. Well, Denver's defense didn't allow the Chargers to get past their own 20-yard line, not just once, but twice during overtime. But the Broncos, they were not able to capitalize on that after this muffed punt. What happened on this play, Ryan? Well, there are multiple coaching points. And just to begin, this is a very, very tough play. And that's why you often see teams put an experienced returner in back there. But you got Montreal Washington, who's really been a surprise for the Broncos. So I understand why he's back here, but we'll start just with the punt. And as the punt gets kicked, 
this is an opportunity now to communicate. There's always an opportunity to communicate when the ball is in the air. And we paused it here because at this point, Montreal Washington has given the fair catch signal. In addition to giving the fair catch signal though, you have to say what they call Peter. Peter, 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 which means stop what you're doing and get away, head towards the line of scrimmage or out of bounds. So I'm not sure whether or not that happened. That's definitely going to be a coaching point. And what's tough too, is you can see at this point, Montreal Washington has his eyes up, his chins in the air following the ball. You really can't see who's in front of you. And oftentimes defenders, as a defender here for the Chargers is doing, is going to come and try and be as close as possible without getting a penalty. Well, with your Montreal, Montreal Washington, at this point, you're trying to catch the ball and you think somebody's interfering with you, possibly a Chargers player. And so you're thinking, I'm just gonna continue with this play, hopefully get a penalty. What he doesn't know, it's his own teammate who shouldn't have been anywhere near that ball once Montreal Washington put up the fair catch signal and said, Peter, Peter, because those guys are trying to track guys while they're running backwards. It's very difficult. And then the ball pops out. You have another issue here. And then the defender for the Chargers is ready to pounce on it. This was catastrophic in the game and a big reason why the Broncos lost. Brian, I asked Zach earlier what he thinks is the biggest issue for this Broncos team right now. What do you think it is? It's just playing four quarters of consistent football. I mean, there have been huge quarters, huge drives, huge plays by the Broncos offensively and defensively, but you have to do it for four quarters, especially in the, in the division of the AFC West with all the talent that's around. You gotta play four quarters of football, and we just haven't seen that from the Broncos yet. We've seen enough good things to know it's there, but they gotta put it together for four quarters. Yes, we hope to see the Broncos clean things up here heading into this week seven matchup with the Jets. Speaking of week seven, still to come, Zach and I will look ahead to Denver's next opponent as Zach Wilson and the Jets make their way to the Mile High City. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Broncos A to Z. It is now time to shift our attention and get into our way too early game preview as the New York Jets fly into Denver looking for their fourth consecutive win. The Jets have four wins throughout the first six weeks, which matches their 2021 season total. So it's safe to say this isn't the same Jets team we've seen the past two years. So Zach, what is clicking for Gang Green right now? Especially in these past three games when they're three and zero, everything is clicking, Alexis. And what's what's crazy about this is Zach Wilson has been in for all three of those games those are the only three starts he has and he only has one passing touchdown and two interceptions in those three games typically if you were to tell me that a quarterback has those stats I would say the team is 0-3 but they're playing really good ball around him the offense is averaging over 30 points per game in those three games and the defense is only allowing 15 points per game that's a recipe for success obviously it's just so impressive that they're doing it with not very good play from their quarterback yeah well New York's defense dominated the Packers and it was their defensive tackle Quinnen Williams he had a lot to do with that he is blowing up the ground game. He is getting after the quarterback week after week. So this Broncos offensive line will need to be stout. What adjustments could you see this offensive line making? Well, Quinn and Williams is someone that the Broncos probably have to turn all of their attention to because of just how good he is. Yeah. He was a top pick in the draft a couple of years ago for this reason, and he's playing the best ball of his career right now. In the past four games, he has four and a half sacks. He's a monster in the middle, and so the Broncos are just going to have to double team him. Now, the good news is Quinn Minerts is back. He he had a good game for the Broncos against the Chargers. Yeah, and you're going to have to use him, Lloyd Cushenberry, everyone on the offensive line. But some adjustments the Broncos are going to have to make on the offensive line is they're going to have to just keep five guys in the whole time. The Broncos kind of moved things around against the Chargers, took uh, Calvin Anderson out, put Billy Turner in at right tackle, Cam Fleming at left. I expect they stick with that for this game. But if, if, I, if I would have a suggestion, I'd say stick with just five guys for the whole game to get that chemistry together. Yeah, the Jets defense also has Sauce Gardner. So offensively, who needs to really step up for the Denver Broncos this week? It's going to have to be Russell Wilson because like we said earlier, when Russell Wilson plays well, the Broncos offense plays well, is able to move the ball, is able to put up points, and the offensive line is going to have to protect him, especially if that hamstring is still bothering him. And that's going to be a very tough task going up against Quinn and Williams. And so you're looking at Billy Turner, who's going to be making his, his first start as a Bronco this week, I expect. And he's going to have to be big to allow him to be on an island, to allow the interior guys to be able to contain Quinn. Okay, well, like you mentioned a little bit earlier, Zach Wilson, he's not doing much, but that's because it's the rookie running back, Brees Hall. He really can do it all. Don't be afraid to make the game plan all about stopping Brees Hall. Kind of like they, they decided that we're going to take Austin Eckler out of the rushing attack, 
do the exact same thing for Brees Hall because in the past three games, despite only starting one game, Brees Hall is averaging over 130 yards from scrimmage and one touchdown per game. He has been the reason why the Jets have been able to score 30 points in this time. If the Broncos take him out of the game, they will win. Well, Zach, the Broncos, they come into this game 0-3 in their last three matchups. The Jets, on the other hand, 3-0. But the Jets opened as three and a half point underdogs. Who do you think has the edge in this game? Well, it's all about the threes here. And yeah. when we're talking about threes, Russell Wilson's number three. And when I look at this game, th there's a lot of different things where you can give the Jets the edge, the Broncos the edge. But when it comes down to the most important position in sports, I still trust Russell Wilson over Zach Wilson here, even with Russell Wilson dealing with an injury. So I understand why Vegas has it as a close game because I see it being that. But I'll give the edge to the Broncos because they have Russ over Zach Wilson. A battle of the Wilsons this week, Zach. Well, as always, we will have a full game preview right here on the Broncos YouTube channel this Friday at 5 o'clock for Broncos Weekend. For Zach Stevens and our entire Broncos broadcast crew, thanks so much for watching. We'll leave you now with some of our favorite still images snapped week six by team photographer Gabriel Christus.